Hello and welcome to the RPG Talk Show. I am your host, Hawk Robinson, with co-host... John Wilker. This show discusses weekly news, information, commentary, discussion, and debate about the effects of all role-playing game formats and their potential uses for professional, educational, recreational, and therapeutic goals. The RPG Talk Show is not about just the latest modules and releases and rule books and such. There are plenty of sources for that information. We will mention such releases when related to the aforementioned topics, however. You can learn more about the RPG Talk Show, hosts, guests, and archives of previous episodes on our website at rpgtalkshow.com. You can follow us on Twitter at RPG Talk Show. You can catch our show live on twitch.tv forward slash RPG Research Thursdays 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Time and chat with us live during the live broadcast. RPG Research Patreon supporters can access the recorded episodes a month or more before uh, they are available to the general public as a thank you to your support. Role-playing game formats include original tabletop, usually referred to as RPG or TRPG. No double T's. <laughs> no, they're everywhere. Live action role-play, although we're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, a.k.a. LARP, uh, a.k.a. LRPG. <clears throat> yes. We'll have to talk about that. Electronic, a.k.a. ERPG, and Solo Adventure Books or Modules, a.k.a. SABM, and Hybrid RPGs, HRPGs. This episode is sponsored by the wonderful Patreon supporters for the nonprofit RPG Research, and we are also sponsored by RPG Therapeutes LLC, and also the Dots RPG Project, because they are also a kind supporter of us on Patreon, and we also are a supporter of them. They are the ones who make these wonderful, high-quality Braille dice, uh, as well as cards to read it, and they're working on Braille character sheets and rules and tablets and just all kinds of things for visual impairment and other accessibility considerations. So do definitely check them out. Let me make sure I don't, because we just added them recently here to the, I want to make sure I don't get the wrong website. Um, yep, dotsrpg.com, so dotsrpg.com. Be sure to check them out. And you can learn more about the nonprofit 501c3 Research and Human Services Organization studying the effects of all RPG formats and their potential improved lives at rpgresearch.com and about RPG Therapeutics LLC, the for-profit professional services company at rpgtherapeutics.com. Our show varies each week, but a typical format may include the latest general RPG news related to our focus on role-playing games and research, community response and discussion, RPG-related theory and application discussions, the latest updates on RPG research, the RPG bus, the RPG trailer, the RPG tour, RPG publishing, RPG education, the list goes on and on. If it has RPG in the front, you always smile. There's a good... No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Don't go there. So... Before we get into the week in RPG news, I wanted to point out that uh, Dr. Megan Connell, psychologist, uh, has posted today an interview she did back at PAX Unplugged back in uh, first of December or so. Correct. And uh, and and I was fortunate enough. She I was one of she she interviewed a number of people, and I was one of them. And so she released the one that I'm in, uh, talking about accessibility and resources for people trying to do research and such related to role playing games. So that is now on YouTube. You can find it under Dr. Megan Connell's. Or it's a Psychology at the Table. That's the, is the name um, of the show. The show. Yes. It's um, Geeks Like Us. Uh, Geeks Like Us. That's right. The, the E's with threes. With threes. Yeah. So elite speak style. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend Psychology at the Table. There's a lot of great articles, and I'm glad that you got an, um, an interview in there. Yes, and uh, despite my rambling style, luckily she steered me back on track. Yeah, she actually kept your interview into less than a day. Yeah, I think it was <laughs> 12 and a half minutes or something, so that's an accomplishment. <laughs> Kudos and thanks, many thanks to her for, for letting me be on her show there. So that's out. Check it out. You can also check it out. It's, on, it's been added to our RPG Research playlist on, on YouTube as well. So you can just find it that way as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, so, John, you want to go ahead, and we've got a lot of news topics to cover. Um, in fact, most of them I'm just going to mention the topic and then move on. We won't be, have a lot of our discussion there's, on it. There's a lot. Um, so, if you the Ninth World. Which is uh, Numenera, Numenera, Monty Cooks, yeah, Monty Cook Games, and the wonderful author. I want to make sure I have her name in my eyesight so I don't mispronounce it because I will mispronounce it. Shanna Germain. Okay. 
She has released a book that may have been out for a little while, but it's only um, in PDF. It's Love and Sex in the Ninth World. And we did an article before about sex and role-playing games. Uh, that's what this book is mostly about, is the inclusion of these topics. Hmm. Uh, not a lot of, of um, gamification in there. Okay. There and, are a couple and of And Monty sex. Cook called it a glimmer. Glimmers are what they call their one-shot supplements okay. that are part of the main core stuff and are only available at PDFs. Okay. Um, but, and in, in a side note also, the they're going 5th edition. Numera has a 5th edition confirmed conversion. For, for D&D 5e D &D Dungeons D &D and Dragons. Okay. Uh, Numera <clears throat> is not a 5th edition book. They, right. I think they're on their In first. fact, we have it, a copy of it on the way for us to evaluate the, the starter box. Or actually, we have it, don't we? We have the we, starter we box. Yeah, right we got there. the starter box we right there. We, we still have to evaluate it. Yeah. I know we're like way behind the curve on that. But we're evaluating it for our specific needs. So, But it's also been adapted for 5th edition that doesn't okay. necessarily make it more Well, that's like useful. AIM versus TOR. Right, right? Exactly. The One Ring role-playing game, which we're running tonight, by the way. If you're curious about the One Ring role-playing game by Cubicle 7, they are the license holders of role-playing gaming for about seven years now. Um, and they first started with the One Ring role-playing game, and then a year ago, has it only been a year? Yes. They came out with Adventures of Middle-Earth, which is Tor adapted to D&D 5th Edition. It's missing a few things from Tor, but they did a good job of porting over most of the Tor feel and flavor into D&D 5th Edition. It feels more like two years. Yeah, I'm wondering. But it's, cause, cause I, I, I've been running It's been one or two long. years, I forget which now. Yeah, yeah probably two years. Just um, a lifetime. So, uh, and they're slowly catching up to all the tour content. There's a lot more tour content books than right. books, but they're, they're catching up. And so tonight from 6 to 9 p.m. for our applied gaming session, uh, I will be GMing or, or lore mastering, as in this case, uh, the tour RPG with the introductory adventure of the Marsh Bell. Now, we were one of the first people in the U.S., like the first 75 people to get copies in the U.S., and so we streamed when it first arrived way back when, you know, six, seven years ago, we streamed the very first adventure way back then and made a lot of mistakes along the way. It is a different style of role play. It really is R O L E play. Um, it's not a it's not a combat heavy system, but it is a rules heavier system than you realize. It looks very rules light, but considering that they've added dice rolls to your interactions and the role play and the so socialization stuff. It actually is a fair amount of, of system the rules. Journey to it. rules, the rules for audiences, introductions, and mm -hmm. encounters, and all of that. It, but it emphasizes more the role playing determination in the role in the rules, and less the combat mechanics. The combat mechanics are pretty; they they work well. They're they're decent enough. They're stance based instead of miniature based, and they work well enough. Man, my phones have been ringing off the hook all day. Oh, shame. I'm going to go ahead and answer that. You want to go on to the next yeah. news thing? Now, I don't normally talk about Pathfinder sure because up. even though I do, do occasionally run okay. the Pathfinder We Be Goblins games, uh -huh. um, it's just it's too much of a split focus for me to do both Dungeons and Dragons uh, organized play and Pathfinder organized play. Uh, but I do want to bring out that it's the Pathfinder 10th anniversary and they're doing a humble uh, RPG book bundle. Uh, Humble bundles are for charity. Um, this particular charities, um, what they're going to be doing is you give a dollar or up to $18, and you can have PDFs of almost everything they've ever published. Uh, it's, it's an incredible amount of books that you can get for $18, hundreds of dollars if you're to buy the PDFs on their own. And they will go to um, a couple different charities that are out there. In fact, I just want to say what those charities are. Because that'd be rude not to. Uh, Camden's Concept benefits Cystic Fibrosis Research and Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. You're welcome, um, Dan. Because I know he, he, that's something he <laughs> cares about. Um, the 
try to get hit the lighter stuff first. We have many articles on how schools spark excitement for learning with role-playing games. We've had many discussions about that. Uh, how Dungeons and Dragons prime students from for interdisciplinary learning, including STEM, uh, that is science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons clubs were starting one for Eagle Peak. Yeah, it's Spokane Public School District, and it's at one of the old public schools, <laughs> Eagle Peak Schools, but it's it's part of the Spokane Public School District. Um, and yeah, so that's uh, they're calling it a creative writing club. The idea is that they're going to write about their adventures and such. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, and to be fair to these articles, uh, kqed.org, uh, MindShift is how schools spark excitement for learning role-playing games. Uh, kqed.org um, also did MindShift, how Dungeons & Dragons prime students for interpersonal learning, including STEM. And the Inlander, our local um, paper, which is a supplement of the Spokesman Review, has an article called Try Turning Off the Screens and Playing a Game Together. This particular article, now that I look at the picture, that's me. Yes. Um, yes, that is. You didn't know that before. <laughs> I, no, when I read the article, I did not look at the picture very carefully and realized that that's my gaming group. Uh, Kids slaying some orcs finding treasure in one of RPG Research's regular sessions at Kendall Yard Spark Central. Uh, technically, they're we're fighting bugbears, but that's not about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we get a good mention in there that we do the twice monthly drop in session for both DD and other role playing games. Um, we're trying to get people to go towards uh, No Thank You Evil, AIM, and um, Doctor Who. That's going to. Dungeons Dragons just happens to be the most popular game on the block, so we stick with that. Um, we move that one because we said we were going to talk about that. Uh, there's a couple articles. GM's Day uh, is coming up on March 4th. So send me presents. Just kidding. <laughs> but um, apparently there was something that happened, and we missed it on February well, this, this looks like it was actually done in 2018. What? The Bronstein um, playthrough, Ancestor of Blackmore, Greyhawk, etc. Yeah, that was last year. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> so, uh, you don't want to go to that. Let's do the time warp again. But there is some controversy that Bronstein is actually the first world Right, which game. there's that whole documentary that there was a Kickstarter for mm -hmm. and was successfully funded just... And so they're they're doing the polish on it now. We got to see the rough uh, edit of it, not even edit, just the rough cut of it. Um, it is very definitely biased to one particular perspective. Uh, doesn't really lay out, you know, all of the the different arguments. And that's that's fine. You know, they they feel like they've been some unheard voices. Right. So as long as everybody's clear that it's it's very much from one perspective. More power to them. And we could definitely go with um, the difference between published and unpublished. Yes, that's that is the key differentiator. Is there may have been all kinds of brewing things going on during those transitional years, but it's I mean it's it's kind of like things like what the phonograph and other things like that. There, but other people who may have invented before, but they didn't get the uh, patent. And they didn't get right. it to the public, so they're and lost from history. Despite how he may have gotten some of those patents, he had the patents. They're his. It's unfortunate, but the world yeah. is that way. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know that it was that, that cutthroat, but by any means, it doesn't sound like it was. Uh, talking to Roger last night, he was talking, because he talked to Dave about that. Mm -hmm. And he said, basically, the, the, the perspective he heard is that a lot of the R-O-L-E play aspects Dave was developing, Dave Arneson, mm -hmm. but Gygax was the one who was really able to quantify things and turn it into a system, a rule system. That was kind of my understanding anyways. Yeah. That um, Arneson had the ideas, the but he had the gamification. Thing. Yeah, it was much more free form. And um, so, you know, again, collaborative. Lots of things are done that way. And, uh, you know, that's why I've always pretty much in all my slides said, you know, co-creators with others of Arneson and Gygax. I've pretty much always just given both of them credit for the evolution of it from Chainmail into, yeah. into D&D. &D. 
Yeah, but yeah, there's a documentary it should be out in a few months but that people will be able to, to check out soon. Perrin Talk was on chainmail before Arneson came on board, but that wasn't a role playing game. That was right. a war game. Right, that was the precursor. So, quick article on WordPress.com. JamieWild.WordPress.com. Uh, good RPG tips, game master techniques for role playing groups. Uh, it was a good article. Um, those of us who've been doing it forever uh, follow these rules, anyways. This could be at one of our classes at some point. Just going into more in game suggestions. There is a complete guide to solo role playing. Yeah, I, that was something I was happy to come across. Despite um, the RPG title, it's RPGready.com. We don't own that one. Yes, that's true. That's <laughs> one we don't. It's one we don't. <coughs> and it has a whole bunch of info on creating your own solo role playing game. I mean, so we're talking more than just a choose your own adventure type, uh, you know, uh, branching fiction. Right. We're talking about actually having dice rolls and monster encounters and stuff like that. So that's a an SRPG, a solo RPG, or really we've been doing it as SABM, solo adventure books and modules. So this tells you where to get the tools to basically kind of, and I you can do it with like Dungeons and Dragons first edition, and I did do this. Right. I made my own adventures as I went by rolling the dungeon creator in the DMG. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons just randomly... Yeah, the first Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 1st Edition had a Dungeon Master's Guide tools for just randomly creating... Um, and I created hundreds of pages of randomly generated dungeons. I kept rolling overly oh. monsters that would kill me. <laughs> so, anyway, you can use that to just entertain yourself if you want. And what it does do is it helps you get really... I got really good with the rules. I got really good with the combat charts. I basically memorized them by spending that time... <laughs> gave me by myself um but it was to achieve you know better mastery and uh so but other, other times it's just you know let's say you don't have a gaming group that week and you're kind of jonesing for a little bit of a fix there's a limited there's a very limited number of books that you can go buy in a solo adventure and most of them are out of print right uh but there are tools out there now there's another one there's an open source one called twine and some of those old ones actually been converted into quote unquote computer games yes like sorcery has a computer game version of it it's still exactly a choose your own adventure yeah. you pick the things but my f one of my first game software programs i wrote around 1979 was it was kind of a cross between zork and a non-graphical wizardry do you remember wizardry with the, the right the wireframe tunnels and the d combat stuff so mine was all text-based but didn't use the natural language it was all basic if then branching but i had randomization built into it i added dice combat rolls and such but it was all just text so it was like it was like a zork adventure but with menu options rather than natural language Right. And random rolls, so the combat could turn out differently each time. It was not consistently the same, depending upon if you had some bad rolls, right? And so I had that was one of my first was I just created my own adventure that way. It was one of my first uh, adventure software programs I wrote in '79. I don't think people give Zork credit enough for how hard it was mm. to program mm. natural language. Mm. Yeah, well, there's a couple of really good books on that yeah. the whole process. Well, anyway. There's a tool, it's open source, it's cross-platform, means you can run on Windows, Windows, Linux, or Mac, called, called Twine. Now, don't mix it with another Twine app. You have to go to Twinery, T-W-I-N-E-R-Y dot O-R-G. And this is a, an open source tool for telling interactive, non-linear stories. And so it lets you, you have a little workspace, and you create all these little boxes and quickly, and it's really for people who are writers, not programmers. Right. And you just quickly write all of their your if then storylines and start connecting them and such. And of course, I don't have it on that screen, but you can see how there's a little branching. Yeah. And so you can't really see that on here, but um, check out twinery.org, and uh, you'll you'll get an idea. It's open source, so it's free. You know, consider donating to them. Um, and uh, so that's that's an interesting way to do to write your own interactive fiction, and they, they list a number of games that have done that. Um, but anyway, this website that we we're just talking about, RPGready.com, has a complete guide to if you want to have full blown adventures, not just your interactive stories. So definitely check that out. 
Okay, um, last of my nice and easy ones is we had a couple articles on LARP. I seem to drop one off my screen here. LARP Safety Manifesto? That was the first, the second one. There was okay. another one earlier, um, schools using LARP, I think. Oh, yes. The, the KQED one. Right. Mind shift, yeah. Okay, I mentioned that already. That's, yep. that's why I did. Yep. Uh, how schools spark learning with role-playing games and they were using LARP. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there's in Denmark, Osterkov After School, which has been doing it for about 15 years or so now. With high school great level. success. Yeah, at high school level. Yeah. Yeah, to keep doing it for that long <laughs> for a government paid school system. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. So there's the article in NordicLARP.org, LARP Safety Manifesto. And. This is discussing... Um, and this is something Sarah Lynn Bowman posted, right. uh, brought my attention to, so, you know, shared it. Definitions by, of safety to include emotional safety? It's from Nude Punk 2019, so it's their, um, their uh, Nordic LARP uh, newsletter and such. NordicLARP.org. Now, this is not an article about safety as in uh, buffer weapons have to be properly... This is emotional safety. Yeah. And... With the topics like bleed and, and things yeah, like that. Because with LARP, because you start physically acting out, you know, you can have you can have bleed easily at a tabletop just because of what you say, but you're not physically doing stuff. Right. LARP, now you're both saying and doing, so the opportunities for bleed are that much more significant and you have to really take that into account or I mean look at how many vampire campaigns go horribly wrong because of the bleed issues in multiple directions. Yeah. Uh, and and I've, I've seen it. I was in those. Uh, yeah, and that's why I was. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I was in the um, Camelera, and I have seen when in, when the game, some of the games I'm running, where people said, "Okay, why did you make that decision?" And their response was because of a real world scenario. The guy says, "But this isn't happening in the real world. You don't have or to worry about what that. happens in the game. They take personally outside right. of the game, and entire relationships have been destroyed." Oh, yeah. Um, which, speaking of which, we did, uh, Eric just, we published an article just last week from uh, Eric. Uh, you have to be a Patreon supporter right now to see it. Talking about bleed. It summarizes all these different topics, several moments and the others, and really explains bleed um, quite quite well for, for beginner introduction for folks. So if you're not a Patreon supporter, check that out. It'll be available in about a month or so to the general public otherwise. I think in LARP, the. Um one of the most overlooked things um, that people have to think is aftercare. Mm -hmm. um, discussion of what happened during the game. And Bowman's really big about that. Right. Um, as evidenced by her article and things like that. Well, this isn't but, her article, but she just pointed it out. Right. Uh, this is uh, several people. Eva Marsk, Linnea Cecilia, Klata Rotvig, and Anders Brenner. I'm sorry if I'm slaughtering the pronunciation there. Uh, so this is there from their presentation. So I'm going to run just through their bullet list, if you don't mind. No, I, I it's their, would recommend it. Okay, definition of safety, inclusivity, communication, priority, hard choices, responsibility for players, organizer care, and failure, and how to address all of those. And then they have a couple of good links. Emotionalsafety.home.blog is one of them. And they do have a Patreon support page. So check that out on nordiclark.org. Uh, definitely worth checking out if you are even if you're not running LARPs, even if you're just running tabletop uh, the things the things they're pointing out are well worth considering and taking into account so we're we're flying through stuff tonight we don't we don't have time to go through there's so much we just want to raise or raise awareness and uh, we won't be able to go as deep tonight as, as we do other times uh, next all right the biggest topic in the book and I really don't want to talk a lot about it but it's necessary that we do bring it up uh, Zach S, okay. aka Zach Smith, aka Zach Shaman. Is that the right word? Sabbath. Zach Sabbath. Yeah. Um, so assume I, I've only recently learned about this person in the last two weeks because I've seen the blogosphere, Twitterverse, Facebookverse go crazy, mm -hmm. and so I followed a couple of articles that people you know said to read. So I have a general, so I've never heard of this person before. I have no idea who this person is. So f assume our listeners never heard of this person, rather than assuming they have. Because <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But Right. Very short summary of what, what is the I controversy. I've never heard of him either. 
um, until this blew up, because even though I do know of and actually know a couple of the people in the, in the industry, um, I can actually say that I've had people at Wizard of the Coast answer my phone calls, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't know who all these people are. Well, we, we got to be on, on their show and stuff last year and all that, too. So. Uh, is it in this book? Where yeah. is the... I don't know what you're looking for. Credits, here it is. Okay. Front page, credits. Is he in there? He is in here. Okay. Um, Bob Hensel, Amy Collins, Bill Savick. Oh, additional consultation provided by, and the last name is Anzac. Yes. So it wasn't even an employee, it's and just... an RPG, but, well, he was a paid consultant. A consultant, yeah. Right. Okay, which is not an employee, that's right. an outside consultant. Okay, all right. But so what is the controversy? Uh, apparently, <clears throat> he's an abusive... Um, Sounds like he's a jerk. He, 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 I, I he said that. jerky uh, things, and he may have done sexual harassment or worse. Abuse, violence, sexual assault. Um, these are his accusations. Okay, has he, he been was, convicted? No, they're has accusations. He, is he in court? No. Not I'm aware that court? he's actually in court. Nobody's civilly gone after him? They may have. Okay, I don't know. I, yeah, I, do, I, I just don't know. I just, okay. Uh, so, Mandy Morbid on okay. Facebook has a giant... Yeah, so my, let me, this is my take on it, and I may, be, I may be wrong, this is just my take on it as kind of an outsider on this. My understanding is there was the whole Gamergate thing back in 2014. Right. Which I was doing research studies on experiences gamer bias in the gaming industry and community back in 2013, before Gamergate. And then when Gamergate happened, it made my follow-up research in 2015 more difficult because of the backlash against it. But anyway, so there was the whole kerfuffle over Gamergate. He apparently said bad things then. Then the years went by, and he made some comment to somebody, key person involved with Gamergate, that was hurtful and rude, and basically like, get over it. You shouldn't like after all Long these person. years. Oh, that's, well, that's somebody else. That's a completely. See, different I can't even keep track. <laughs> that's a completely. Different oh, that was another a person. Sm oh, smaller. We talked about that last. That week. was last week. Okay, that's so which one is Zach S? I Zach S. Um, a play tister that apparently people don't feel safe around. Okay. Um, dude, uh, Mike Merles is being complained with him, but he has been sexist. He's been abusive. He's touched people inappropriately. These okay. are the kinds of things. What that was the trigger do. that caused this to blow up two weeks ago or a week and a half ago? Something. I thought it was something he said, but that was somebody else that did that. No, people started publishing that um, Me Too type things about him. Okay, so because of the other guy. This guy came up? They don't say that. There's okay. nobody who so, links the two items. So why is why is this such a why has this come up this past two weeks? Why is this a current issue right now? Um because somebody named Hannah, back when I first met him, I lauded man and Zach a perfect couple, la la la. So something she wrote, it wasn't in response to something he did? Right. There are people that wrote articles and then people start saying Picked I believe you, etc. Okay. okay. Um, it would take me too long to go. Okay, yeah, we don't, we don't, want, and I, I'm afraid to even touch this with a 10 foot cattle Right, rod. so I, <laughs> the, the, the whole issue is that Wizard of the Coast, Gen Con, um, LOTFP, um, all are responding to. Well, drive, so it, this is the one though that Drive Through RPG now is removing all content of his, right? Correct. They are banning all his content. And he is being all future publications of. Of the any player's handbook he's being removed will be, from. his name will be removed from. Even if, even if he was a consultant on here, his name is now off the book. That sure sounds like a lawsuit brewing to me. <laughs> it may be. We'll um, see. Oh, boy. All I've right. had a lot of questions recently about Dini's relations with certain playtests, and I want to make sure our stance is clear. Zach Smith was an early playtester for 5th edition in D&D until 2014. There were 78,000 playtesters. Right. As far as the public ones. And or downloads anyway. To all D and D fans, we spent the week listening and learning from the D and D community. Zach Smith, along with many others who engage, provide feedback. We can hire. We applaud D and D's community support and other fully support the plan. Dungeon Masters Guild bundle raising funds to donate to Rain Rape Abuse and Incense National okay. Network. Okay. Uh, grateful part of the community. 
Gen Con has um, basically so, said he's not allowed. I get it. This guy is persona non grata. Sounds like he's a jerk. Sounds like he's done terrible things. Got it. Right. Even Laminations of the Flame Princess has said no. I don't know what the significance is of that. Uh, Laminations of the Flame Princess is the not safe for work or um, other people's around type role playing game. Okay. Uh, one of their books is Vagina Vaginas Are Magical. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's a, that's a medical term. I can say that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, um, it's so I, I saw this going on, and somebody posted asking if uh, so. Following a Facebook thread about this, yeah. Somebody asked, posted a new thread saying, "Is there a blacklist somewhere that I can consult so I know the people not to associate with as I reach out?" at conventions and as I want to get my book published or I want to find artists or have play testers, is there a blacklist I can go to so that I can avoid what happened here with wizards? I don't want to have these people, you know, in my orbits because I mean, look at Mike Merles and all that. They're, they're getting the splatter effect from all of this for, for being peripherally involved. And I don't know how much peripherally or closely, I don't know. Yeah. But um, Mike Merles is taking as far as I know, Mike Merles isn't accused of doing anything directly other than just his association and engaging in some way the services of this Zach S. person, right? Right. Okay. Um, the, the worst crime that he supposedly committed was that he um, had been warned about his existence and didn't do anything about it. Okay. So, so somebody may have warned him. He may have discounted it. So, for example, last year, people suggested we should reach out to Will Wheaton and Felicia Day because... They've been big advocates for geek culture, and if we could ever get them to pay attention to the research we're doing, it might be really helpful for our fundraising. Right. So, because they're really big. Names. So I started putting out the word, asking people to try to get us there, and and what happened was a few people said, "No, no, 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 you do not want to ask for their attention." I'm like, what are you talking about? Because of their friendship with some actor. They had become persona non grata because they of abusing his girlfriend. Right, did something inappropriate and 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 is you know uh, out on his tail, but because they didn't actively disavow him, like they're saying they're waiting to see what happened in right. court, or they didn't want to say because he was they were friends with him, they got lambasted to the point where Will Wheaton left Twitter for some time, right, for many months. So if somebody's accused of anything that anything. <laughs> and you don't immediately take the side of the people that are doing the accusing, then you're as bad as if you had committed the crime yourself, assuming that a crime had actually been committed. Right, and there was an assumption there, I assume at that point, I don't know if later there was court stuff that proved it or what, I don't know. And I know it's yeah. the whole, unfortunately, all too often these things don't get properly taken care of, they don't go to court because of the shaming. I understand all that, I'm not arguing against any of that. But this is something sociocultural that's happening of late um and so my uh, so i'm all against a blacklist because i understand how bad that is and that's basically what a lot of people in the thread said is right. that would be bad news and it'd probably be illegal and set yourself up for lawsuits etc um but i understand the sentiment of the person saying how do i know who to avoid and they're like well you just need to know these things like there are not enough hours of the day to keep up with all of these scandals in every different branch of fandom. <coughs> so, so it triggered my own questions. I was like, you know, that's actually a really good question. So I posted first there on Facebook and then as a, a blog posting about controversial figures in fandom. So if you go to RPGResearch.com, I got a little blog posting that is under our blog section. And there's a uh, a red person with a, or a black, uh, a, I don't know, a figure, a stick figure with a circle and a slash through it that says persona non grata, you know, which is, right, yeah. you know, a person that's not, you know, not allowed, basically. And so it's controversial figures in fandom, persona non grata, research resources. Uh, once again, someone has become, or apparently was for some time, persona non grata because of some terrible words or deeds. I've never had any awareness of this person but have seen over the past week a lot of threads discussing. This leads me to wondering, is there anywhere someone outside of this insular community of in-groups could find information about the controversial figures in various fandoms? Everybody's got in-group and out-group. 
Um, I've been involved with role-playing games since the 70s, etc., but I don't really feel as part of the in-group. I, I spend a lot of time associating with people outside of gaming, introducing them to gaming. Right. I don't spend as much time, quote-unquote, preaching to the choir, trying to convince gamers about the joys of gaming, because that's not necessary, <laughs> in my view. I need to focus on getting the word out to all the other people outside of gaming and fandom. And so... As much as I game, and I've been doing it since the 70s, like you have, right. um, I, I, again, I don't really, I, I think you probably feel more part of the in-group uh, part of it than I do. I, I think you're very much more connected and I, I'm more connected culture than you are, but I am still on the periphery as far as all these celebrities and stuff. Are yeah, the celebrities, but as far as geek culture and right. gamer culture, you're very much connected socially. I'm not. I've... I, I, I love the gaming, I do the gaming, but it's become this kind of scientific slash therapeutic thing that I do for people in a service. And I've never personally fully identified as a gamer. I've had many other facets. Right now, I'm very focused on this. Um, but anyway, it, you know, it's something that, so I, I'm looking at it kind of as an outsider, right? Looking at this going, hmm, this is fascinating. Fascinating, Captain. Right? Yeah. And so as a researcher... Um, my concern is if I accidentally cite, use, or associate with someone that's persona non grata and inadvertently alienate folks that would have otherwise benefited from my research or my therapeutic programs, or ours as a group, whether it affects RPG research, right? And I've already up, seen how easy it is to offend people. Yes, I do an interview, like I did the road trip for the RPG tour through eight states for 26 days. I interviewed all kinds of people that I'd never met before. And... What if I had interviewed this Zach S. person or something on the road trip, you know, and, and gave him airtime, not knowing anything about his past, right? right? You know, then I'd probably be on the same crap list that, that Mike Merles and everybody's on. So, I agree there should not be a blacklist. What I would like to know is if anybody has done objective research to aggregate notable and controversial entities so that that can be a rule book. It can be a concept, a theory. It can be a person. And just tagged, notable, and if there's controversy, because most notable people, there's usually controversiality, but not always. Right. Um, so, for example, the theory of um, uh, catharsis. Very popular in, in the 70s and 80s, well, before that, but up until about the 80s. And then... As more as stronger research was done, the empirical evidence wasn't good, and so catharsis has fallen out of popularity. Has become a controversial topic. A lot of people discount it and say it's not really legitimate. Catharsis is the concept that you can kind of get anger out of your system. That was where the Bataka bats came out and things right. like that. And instead, they say no, it's modeling the behavior, it's reinforcing the behavior, and so it's been you know they're saying that it's now a controversial thing and not recommended. Um, why are, am I am hearing I'm hearing some kind of messaging going on here? I think it's um, Discord. Is it? I'm Is pretty it, sure it's it, my Discord. Okay. If not yours. Uh, Geek Therapy seems to be blowing up, and every time someone says okay. something. Okay, okay. And I'm trying if to it's not our to, channel, so. How to make all right. The other channels. <coughs> I don't need all these. I love Geek Therapy. Uh, I'm trying to get more into it, but they are overly <coughs> useful. Okay, Rickety Cat says, you must hate this person in quotes, exclamation mark. Anyone who says this who is not the investigator or on the jury or the judge themselves becomes the person shunned in my world. Right, the, so that's a lot of the problems with the whole court system when it comes to rape and th things like that. It's, you it, are been tried a lot, in the yeah. public court before you are in the real court. Well, both sides. So yeah. e either side gets shunned, and it, it is really problematic. And I totally agree that's very problematic and, and a great concern. Um, but setting that aside, as a researcher, as a therapist and such, is there a resource where I can find a list where... So I can't research every single person I run into. I do background checks as much as I can, but that costs money, costs a lot of money. Um, all of our volunteers go through background checks. All of our employees go through, you know, on LLC side, go through background checks. But I don't run background checks on every single client I work with or every single researcher I interact with or every single piece I, I cite. Um, and, you know, you can only go so deep. Like, you got to focus on a topic, and if you start going to the rabbit hole of everything and everything and everything, you're never getting done. It's analysis paralysis. Right. 
But if there was a resource that said, here's a quick list, you know, here's a searchable index of controversial figures or topics, whatever, related to whatever, that I could quickly keyword search that are all in one place because it's not going to show up on the web. It's too much. Right. Um, that would be a useful resource, not a blacklist, but just something that says, yes, there's controversy. Here's the, here's the, the, the claims. Here's the anti-claims, whatever. It's just lay it all out there. Old school journalism. Don't put your opinion to it. Don't filter it. Just objectively list what the different sides of the situation are. And then you as a researcher or a therapist or a service provider, you go, I don't think I want to get in the middle of that one. Or go, you know, I don't think there's enough there. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to go ahead and associate with whatever this topic is or person or entity right. or business or rule book or whatever. <clears throat> but at least some way to say, if I grab this book off the shelf and I type in, you know, D&D Player's Handbook, well, we'll get all the controversy from the 1980s about bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. But now there's going to be a whole new thing about Zach S. and Mike Merles and such. But to do that on the general web or to try to do that in a university database, right. <laughs> and it's going to get buried very quickly, right? It's going to, for the web, it's going to bury very quickly. And so I've gone ahead and until I find a reason, hopefully somebody out there is already doing one, but I, I wonder about the objectivity. So on our, all of our content, I've added a tag on rpcresearch.com where I can tag controversial right a controversial topic or a controversial person or entity and then now there's a collection that will automatically find any content that's tagged controversial and can do a quick sort through for that um, who that will hopefully help me have some idea over time now it's going to take a while for that database to be of any use and it won't pass judgment in any way it's just going to say i mean like gary gygax is going to be controversial dave arneson's going to be controversial Gygax was doing cocaine and stuff in the 80s. You know? I mean, he, the he FBI was all, all over him. Wives, yeah, sure. so he's uh, going to get flagged controversial. Then I have to decide when I find that, I go, is this enough for me to be worried about in associating in my research or not? Do I need to put some disclaimers if I put it in my research? And when do you separate the uh, artist from the art? Right, which, yeah. If you can. Yeah, if you can, yeah. So that's... Uh, Ricky Cat says, so did Mighty Mouse. So did Mighty Mouse what? What did so did Mighty Mouse do? I'm not sure what the context is. Please give us context. I'd love to know what, what Mighty Mouse did. Mighty Mouse did something bad? Did Mighty Mouse do something that Maybe the writer controversial? Mighty Mouse did? Yeah, I don't know. Mighty Mouse has not been around for Oh, long. Mighty Mouse did cocaine? Oh. What? Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe. I don't See, know. these are these interesting that was little things. Ago. I, I uh, don't there know. was a, a Marvel character who got his powers from doing cocaine. <laughs> uh, so Mighty Mouse is not. Thank you for that. That's interesting. <laughs> Mighty Mouse. Um, so before we, uh, so anyway. I, I did a little article about that, and then I've created these little tags, and then we'll see if that becomes useful or not. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> it It is becoming a real minefield out there, that's for sure. There's an article, um, and, Adventures of Mighty Mouse. Well, okay. Cool. Um, so anyway, in my little blog post, it talks about where's the fine line between appropriate um, ostracization, right? Ostracizing people mm -hmm. because you want a, a an appropriate social collective social change. You want society to shift a certain direction. Where is that appropriate line? And going down the slippery slope towards uh, the Salem witch hunts and the Scarlet Letter and things like right. that. It's it's so tricky. Um, you know, it's it's of concern. I don't know where to. I don't have an answer to that. It, but it is a concern that people need to keep that in mind and try to keep that balance that when we go when we go farther and farther further and further away from the rule of law that then it gets much more amorphous and much more subjective and less objective and what generally happens then is the minority suffers when that happens so right. the rule of law tends to now again lots of times it doesn't but the rule of law tries to protect the the minority that otherwise the majority would stomp all over because in the moment of mob rule minorities suffer and then you put laws in place that try to protect those minorities in the future very imperfect obviously but that is what rule of law can help do without rule of law that doesn't happen without rule of law it's always the majority rules my makes right bad stuff happens and if there's more of us than there are of you yeah and right now that's what's happening all over the web is we have 
this social movement that is saying, hey, society, we need to make some changes here. Great. Agree with that. Completely. You definitely want these. And it have to be careful. <laughs> As a lot of people, these threads were pointing out. Yeah, by saying my, there shouldn't be a blacklist. My biggest fear with all of this is, and this is probably going to get me in trouble, but my biggest fear is we are convicting people the moment they're confused. Uh, Accused. Accused, right. I, if they're guilty, hang them. So my understanding is, I don't know about Zach S., but this other guy before, he said stuff. Like, he's blatantly said, yeah, I'm this way and I think this, and so hung himself with his own rope. He, he, so that's the court of public opinion, and is, and he said it clearly and openly, saying, F you. Okay. <laughs> I don't think you need to go to court for that one if they openly admit it. Right. Um, yeah, it's more he, problematic when they he don't. Does. That was... Um, he says, I said this, mm -hmm. it was insensitive, it belittled, it was insulting, and it was wrong, and I'm voluntarily stepping down. Right. That is how it should work. Uh, that was the examiner guy, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, our, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, that's who it right was. Now. That's who I keep conflating. This, it was not Zach S. No, it was, <laughs> it was the examiner guy who's stepping down. Or not examiner. Um, our, not RPG site. Uh... Oh, I'm blanking on it. It was in The Escapist. The Escapist, that was it. Russ that, Pitts. Yeah, the, the, the person uh, in The Escapist, yeah. He, uh, I'm pulling up he the criticized article. somebody from Gamergate saying, why don't you get over it, and blah, 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 blah. And well, he wrote really an article yeah. about Gamergate. He yeah. did not um, talk to Zoe Quinn, who was the first target of Gamergate. Okay. She, she was the reason Gamergate happened. Okay. Uh, so The Escapist is editor-in-chief. He's taking the voluntary leadership um, step down. He also had other programs he was in that he's also not doing right now. But he basically said, sorry, Zoe, I generally thought you'd probably be over this being all right. about he, you. He, he was like, get over it, grow up, whatever. He was very rude about it, yeah. Right. Yeah, and not he, wise. And he admits it. <laughs> and when he, when he looks back at it and says, yeah. that was the stupidest thing I ever said. Yep. Um, it's time for me to back out of this. Yep. Um, he's also uh, associated with Take This. Right, he was on the board, and he, I don't know if he was asked, but he has left the board. Correct. Uh, which is uh, run by Dr. B, Rafael Bocamazzo. So all these things happening really had me going, uh, this is turned into a real minefield out there. How do you know how to navigate it? You cannot spend every waking hour trying to keep up with every scandal and every fandom. It's not humanly possible. And this also brings up another warning to everybody. Um... Uh, don't have heroes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Everybody... Einstein, Carl Sagan, Bill Cosby. I was just like, oh my gosh, come on. Yeah. John Wayne. Yeah, John Wayne. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a racist homophobe. <laughs> In the 1970s, he's dead. Leave him alone. He, he, can't, he can't apologize now. Don't bring him up anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And, you know, you've heard me talk about my little theory about the more successful people are, generally the more flawed they are to have gotten to that level of success. Right. That there, that there had to be something driving them outside of the comfort zone that other people would stay within. Other people, so, like, I had the opportunity to go have my first million dollar year back in 2002 or whatever. And I chose family over that. So I had to make a conscious choice. I had my first million dollar year or go back and save my family. It was more important to save my family, so I didn't have my first million dollar year back then. So there would have had to have been something quote unquote broken, or at least a difficult choice of choosing financial success over family. For me, family is more important. Lots of other people, financial and business success is more important. And I've met a lot of CEOs for large corporations, you know, and and and, but you know, Barnes and Noble and Amazon, all these different people, and. Really neurotic folk, <laughs> really high strung. Wow, but they're driven, right? Because of whatever their their flaws are. And this is when we talk about like the ideal role playing game, making sure that it has these kinds of flaws that people need to 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 stand out from the crowd. To go outside of your comfort zone, there must be a level of discomfort that's driving you to not want to stay in the safe zone. Doctor Who highly encourages taking up flaws. Yes, and we're talking a lot of games too. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's that's real. It's 
you did nobody got anywhere without making somebody else sad. Yeah. Do you want to quickly talk about those? Uh, kids on bikes. We tested that the early version of it last year. Very interesting. Which was a lot of fun. Uh, it seemed like a fairly simple system to work with. It does have a unique dynamic where you help create the other players thing. I don't recommend it for at risk because uh, you have to be resentment. You can, you can people say you did what? As long as it's friends, as long as you're friends and stuff, right. then no problem. At risk populations, I'd be hesitant. Teenagers that are pretty stable, sure, fine. Uh, new book came out. Did you say teenagers who are pretty pretty stable? Isn't that an oxymoron? It is. <laughs> uh, Neural pruning, myelination of the sheath. Any that teenager that stuff. was smarter than I was. <laughs> no. Nobody? Okay. Um, <laughs> they came out with the first set of modules. It's uh, Strange Adventures of Volume 1. It has got multiple, um, basically it's modules. And like... Just a whole bunch of story ideas and things cool. like that. They also have a cards out that are supposed to be useful in the game. I haven't bought them or looked at them, so I can't say anything about it. Um, hopefully, we'll it's very much in the comic one. book style there. Well, uh, the layout th that that is most certainly a comic book style cover. That yeah, is, uh, that's got to be intentional. Yeah. Oh yeah. But um, if you like Stranger Things, you might like Strange Adventures. Hmm. Um, and of course, coming out in two months is the Stranger Things D and D game. Right, the box set is yeah. the starter set. It is actually fifth edition. It's even but, though it looks. But like did you it. notice it's coming out through Hasbro Games, not Wizards of the Coast? Wizards right. of the Coast is on there because of the license, but it's not Wizards of the Coast producing it. Which is very interesting. Which makes me wonder if Hasbro is planning a. If you've got two redundant departments. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it could be a problem. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Um, and I don't know how well ECB is going to play. I mean, the adventure, it was written by the character from Stranger Things. Mm. And the, char the um, player characters were the ones that the characters in Kids Stranger were Things playing were playing in the story. Play, okay. playing the story. Yeah. So, I don't know. Demi Gorgon <clears throat> might be real early. <laughs> 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 That's true. But you do have the new um, Demogorgon miniatures, which don't look anything like And I do have the old Demogorgon, 1980s Demogorgon miniature. Right. I but do have it. But their Demogorgons are the Stranger Things monsters oh, uh, with the okay. flower faces. Okay. <laughs> and then another one, so we've been getting, you know, building up our kits, but also we've been evaluating different superhero games to try to find the ones that have more, keep you on the heroic side rather than the dark side and have behavior modification that might be helpful for working with at-risk populations. And so the latest one to arrive in the mail yesterday is BASH! Just simply BASH! Exclamation mark. Because Ultimate Edition. Game. The role-playing game. <laughs> from Basic Action Games. Ever want to be a superhero? All you need is a pair of dice, this book, and imagination. Streamlined rules make it quick to make a hero and easy to play. Customize dozens of powers to make any sort of superhero from low-powered mystery men to comic heroes who defend the galaxy. Play in a variety of eras and settings, such as the Golden Age or Silver Age of comics, sci-fi superheroes, and more. Dozens of pre-made archetypes let you quickly create heroes and villains so you can just pick up and play. And I got a little dice roll cross-reference chart. So we've got now like half a dozen or more in-print superhero games that we have to evaluate. We're going to have to get on the ball with that pretty soon. I think maybe next week, if we can remember, I, I should get together all the, the superhero stack that we have so far and just quickly run it by. Well, just show people the kind of the history that we have accumulated from, because I have the old Marvel box and all of those. Kind of show the ones that are out of print and then show all the ones that are in print and then maybe start to schedule ones to start getting that down. What do you think of that for next week? That works. Okay, so RPG Talk Show next week, we're going to do a little... Uh, Superhero discussion, maybe if we, you know, Dan can't because of work. Hopefully, it'll be less news. But, yeah. <laughs> Man. Whew. Boy, we, we did have a, a lot to cover there. We wanted to go over. We, we did, which we, one? Uh, the topic we wanted to go over, uh, which ironically From is about week. time, is we wanted to talk about long term games. Oh, we were going to talk about long term campaigns. Yep, yeah, and we, we are out of time. Hour just, just flying through the news. Here's yeah. the title. Boom. Yeah, Next yeah. article. A lot to cover. A lot to cover. Um, yeah, so because we saw people asking about what it takes to run a long-term campaign. Now, John, you've um, 
You said the longest you've run is about a year? Yeah. Okay. Um, I ran the entire uh, Ravenloft campaign. That took a year? Right. Once a week? Correct. Okay. How long were your sessions? Uh, six hours. Five to six hours. Okay. So Depending good on long sessions. Stop yapping at each other. Um, and that was the fifth edition campaign. Okay. Of it. Okay. That was a long um, I moved so often in the yeah, army. No problem, yeah. Longest I did was seven years with the same people. Um, it was related to Beiru, the world's of Beiru multiverse campaign. Um, that was part of why I was able to do so long, because it was multiverse. If I started to get bored with a certain setting or whatever, I could shove them into another multiverse and have them deal with that. I want to play Star Trek again. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Wander through the mists and end up who knows where. And the only reason we stopped is moving. I, I moved, they moved, we all moved, and we, we tried continuing over the internet for a little while, but that didn't happen. The second longest one, I think, was MERP, Middle Earth Role Playing. Right. Um, a good three to five years, I can't remember. I think one group, so there was Thomas Hugens, and then there was Ringlin Aketa, and Ringlin Aketa didn't last as long as Thomas Hugens, but it was three, four, five years. I think five years for the first group, and then three years for the second group. Um, so pretty long campaigns. So we were going to talk about a lot of the tricks of, of the trade for that, but we're out of time. I'm sorry. We'll see. Maybe if we can, next time. Next time we're probably going to be talking all about super. Somebody write stuff. an article about the world's <laughs> longest campaign, right? Which was I was going to Google. I think it was 36 years. Yeah. Well, there's one that's still going, right? Is it that one? I think. Yeah. Probably the one I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for joining us. And if you're not a don't get a donor to RPG Research, please swing by RPGResearch.com and click on donate. Uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit studying the effects of all role playing game formats and their potential to help improve lives. And uh, also be sure to check out dotsrpg.com. They're making braille dice for people with visual impairments as well as other accessible equipment. They're also uh, getting, they're trying to get their nonprofit together. So if you swing by their Patreon, help them so they get the funds to cover their nonprofit filing fees. And, uh, and then RPG Therapeutics, which is a professional services uh, organization at rpgtherapy.com. Wherever you may be, be well, happy gaming, and namariye. Dream well. <laughs>